welcome to Central Christian Church from the historic sanctuary that has been here since 1900. And uh, we are coming to you with our worship podcast today. Hope you are well and good. Today we will have some decent music and we'll also be celebrating at the table. And so we ask that you would gather wherever you are uh, some elements that you can use for communion so that we can all take communion together uh, during this podcast. Also, you will see our uh, website listed and my email listed on the bottom here. And uh, we would be happy to pray with you for whatever you like. We we carry some prayer requests from all over the world sometimes. And uh, so we'd be happy to hear from you. Also, you can find out about our church uh, by going to our website and see what all is going on here. Wherever you are today, we hope that you are well and that you are happy. And we want to welcome you to Central Christian Church. Something that uh, is prevalent and uh, regularly talked about uh, in sermons and Bible studies, uh, how to avoid it, uh, what to do, you know, the problem of constantly being uh, battled with uh, things that entice us to walk away from God, to be um, distanced from God. Uh, there, there is some uh, issue about, um, you know, what, what is really temptation? Is temptation a sin? Um, some people are tempted by one thing. Some people are tempted by another. Everybody's different. Uh, one of the nice things to remember is that temptation in itself is obviously not a sin. Jesus was tempted. And as we look at this scripture passage where Jesus is going through this period of 40 days after his baptism, uh, we realize that not only was he tempted and he was perfect, but he was tempted in these core ways that we are tempted. And how he handles it teaches us a lot about temptation. First, let's set up the context of what we're talking about with this, um, with this specific passage. Uh, this is the 15th year of the rule of Caesar, Tiberius Caesar. Uh, Pontius Pilate uh, is, is obviously the governor of Judah. Herod's in um, Galilee. He's the tet- tetrarch. Um, the um, scripture implies that Jesus' cousin John, remember John is the son of Zacharias, and, and, uh, and so um, he is, he is Jesus', Jesus', Jesus cousin, Elizabeth's son. Elizabeth is somehow related to Mary. And so, um, so John is in, 
it, it hints that he's already in the wilderness, but, but at that time it said he was, uh, the word came to him. The, the, the word for word here is rhema. Uh, the spoken word of God uh, comes to John and, and it leads him to this place that is now known as Kasser al-Yayud. And Kasser al-Yayud is the spot where the Israelites uh, crossed over the Jordan into the Promised Land. And that is the spot where John ended up baptizing. Baptizing people for metanoia, to change their direction, telling them the kingdom of God was at hand, and also telling them about his cousin, Jesus, the one who is, by John's definition, the anointed one. Jesus comes to be baptized, not for the washing away of sin, but under the tradition that if he was going to start a new thing, which he was going to start uh, being an itinerant rabbi, uh, as he was starting that, as all adult males did when they got to this point, they would do a couple of things. They would have a baptism, the washing away of the old self, the stepping out of the water into the new self, into new life of this new journey. And then they would go on a sojourn. This isn't out of the ordinary. We see it in many cultures where uh, you go and have a soul-searching time alone by yourself. The Native Americans do that. Uh, it's popular in the Middle East. This was also something that was preparatory for anyone who was going to go into the priesthood uh, as a rabbi. And so Jesus did that. Interesting that it says the Spirit led him. The Spirit led him into the wilderness. Now, all around Qasr al-Yayud is, is just nothing but sand and every once in a while some river rock, uh, and it's pretty barren. It's, it's pretty awful and uh, would be hard to find shelter. Uh, it's hot during the day. It's cold at night. It's, uh, it's just a wild place. And that's where Jesus was, and the Spirit led him to that. It says... Uh, at this point, that he went by himself there to be, uh, and the word is um, the word is peirazo, peirazo, peirazo. It's hard for me to say for some reason, which means um, scrutinized, tested, um, sometimes enticed, but more often than not, this word is used to prove something, to prove silver to prove someone's worth. It's like vetting. Um, another point here is to remind ourselves that God does not tempt us. The Spirit led Jesus into a time, into a wilderness where Jesus would be proved. The Spirit did that. But God cannot be tempted and God does not tempt. So he led him to this place where it says Satan. Now Satan is um, translated uh, from the Old Testament word for, uh, for Satan, which is uh, for this being that was created. He's not omnipresent, but he's ubiquitous. Um, and he is, uh, the, what his name is translated into directly is the false accuser. Uh, this is the name that was used in the Old Testament. There are some other names, the adversary, and things like that, that are used in the New Testament. He comes to Jesus and he tempts him. He, he tests him. It's better to think of this as testing. He is, he is trying to test Jesus' worth and have Jesus test his own worth. Are you really who you think you are, basically? And in these three arenas, of, of temptation or of testing, we can also see that we're tested in these arenas. First of all, um, it, one of them is the mountain. And on the mountain, um, Satan takes Jesus and, and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. It's implied that these are kingdoms that have been, kingdoms that will be, king, kingdoms that are. And he he entices Jesus to make things easy. Remember, if Jesus did this, the Jews would not only be free from the past, but they would be free from the present. Uh, they would be, the tables would be turned. Balance of power would no longer be with Rome. It would be in Jerusalem. Um, they, 
He's tempted to make things easier and do it the way the world does uh, does it. If you uh, think of what you could do if you were the ruler of every kingdom, ruler of every kingdom, anything that you tried to do, you could simply do. You could simply dictate it. It's like us when we're tempted or enticed to power. Uh, to force, to leadership. There's nothing wrong with having power as long as you know how to wield it. But sometimes we are tempted to violence, uh, to gain power. We are tempted to make uh, rash decisions. We are tempted to tell people what to do and simply take over and be in charge. We are tempted by power as Jesus was tempted. Why? Because sometimes that's the quick and easy way in our minds to take care of things that we see that are wrong. Jesus' answer to this was a scripture that he quoted, worship the Lord, because Satan had said, all this can be yours if you worship me. Jesus said, worship the Lord and serve him only. Each time Jesus was tempted in this specific temptation or when when power was brought up uh, by the disciples, for instance, when they said, you know, why don't you just go in? And we're assuming you're just going in with the sword and just overturning and, and uh, grasping onto the throne for yourself. Every time that happened between the disciples and Jesus, what did he do? He turned everything around to servant leadership. He turned everything around so that they would see what he later then said. If you want to lead, you have to be a servant because leaders are the first servants. They are there to serve the people. And so every time Jesus was tempted through his disciples or tempted through others to do that, he always turned it back to servanthood. What he did with Satan, who offered to give him the easy way to make sure everybody did God's will, he said, you know what, let's serve God first. Serve him first and only. And so I, even Jesus, can only serve him only. And we'll see what he has to do. Sometimes we're tempted to power. Sometimes we're tempted to do things to gain power, things that we probably shouldn't do. There's another focus of the temptation, and that's religion. Jesus was taken up, it says, to the highest point of the temple, and Satan asked him to throw himself down, because after all, didn't it say the angels would come and tend to you? Now, many of us think this is a temptation to test his superpowers. Will he live if he throws himself down from the temple? But actually, this is another place where you have to know the context. And in the context, what Jesus would have been doing and what Satan was tempting him to do is fulfill the expectations of the Jewish church, which was that the Messiah would descend with angels to the temple complex. Jesus would establish not just uh, himself, but he would establish his, his religion by entering the world exactly the way uh, it was predicted that he would come to the temple courtyard, therefore saying, my stamp of approval is on this religion, embracing this institutionalized religion. The oppression of the priests uh, by the priests would be gone. The heavy yoke on all of the Jews would be gone, would be replaced instantly by God's own directions. And there would be a state church. It would be the national church. For us, this temptation is when we are tested to see if we are following uh, religion or if we are following Jesus. Uh, have we, are we tempted to disbelieve? Are we tempted to exchange? Are we tempted to replace? Uh, sometimes we are tempted to do things rather than do for people or be in a good relationship with God. Sometimes we're tempted to believe that busyness is de- next to godliness. And we are, when we are tempted to believe that goodness uh, sometimes makes us presentable, doing good things makes us presentable before God. In all those things, uh, still the answer for Jesus directly to Satan was, don't tempt me. 
<laughs> basically, do not test the Lord your God. Don't tempt me. Which means that Jesus was tempted to establish himself and establish a state church and establish all this. But it's not about the religion and it's not about embracing uh, one form. Jesus was very careful to make sure, you know, don't, don't test God in this. Let me do it my own way. And everything else throughout the scripture says, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. It's about making sure that we are connected with God so that we are doing things that God wants us to do, not connected so much to the institution of um, institutionalized uh, religion. We are there uh, to do God's will, to connect with God. We are sometimes tempted away from that. We are tempted to fulfill what people would think the church should do rather than what God would do. Jesus says to Satan, don't tempt God. Don't, that's something you shouldn't do. First of all, worship God only. Don't tempt God. In both of those cases, he's telling us how to reply to this. Don't tempt God with this. Let us have relationships with God. Let institutionalized religion have its place. But God is not going to endorse one over the other. The most um, probably imminent uh, temptation for Jesus. I said, when you when you go out of Kasaral Yud and you're in, uh, in this wilderness area, we went from there to Jericho. And Jericho is an oasis. But before you get there, you're in this desert. And it's filled with these odd stones. They're large and they look like they're river rock. They look like they've been, they've been sanded by the water. And if you squint, they look like loaves of bread, which is really interesting. Well, Jesus, his 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 immediate need, his immediate temptation, was that he was hungry. And sometimes we look at this uh, temptation and think that it's really just a temptation uh, about Jesus' hunger. But it actually goes a little bit broader than that when you think of the, um, well, what would happen if Jesus could turn stone to bread? Think of the implications of Jesus being able to be a welfare state and feeding the world. Jesus is tempted here to become the welfare king. His own hunger would be gone, um, and he could eliminate hunger altogether, which would also um, change the economy. Um, we're tempted to escape an economic system um, when we are hungry. We're tempted to see the immediate state of our need as being the primary state of everybody's need. We're tempted to satisfy our own wants over the needs. Jesus is tempted to satisfy his own want, his own need, when there are greater needs. And so he understands that greater need, and you can tell by what his response is. His response comes by saying, man doesn't live on bread alone. The priority is wrong here. I may be starving right now. I may be so hungry that it's immediate for me. But my heart and my head tell me that the greater need is that people hunger for God. When we're tempted to... Um, see our immediate need as the need and primary need. And when we're tempted to see our wants as needs, we need to remember there is something greater going on here. And yes, God treats us, everyone, like we are the only individuals on the earth. But the truth of the matter is he treats everybody like that. And there are more people than just us on the earth. He directly answers this temptation later when he says, it's me. You don't want this bread. You want me. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And the crowds followed because he fed them. But he knew that miracles do not make mature followers. And so he gives them an answer. The answer is me. Somehow, when you are satisfied inside first and out, then physical needs are taken care of, not just for you, but for those around you because you're connected to other people. The good news is this. 
The good news is that temptation is nothing but a test, a test to see if you are who you say you are. I believe God is who he says he is, and I choose to follow. I'm a believer and a follower. Truly, well, let's test that. And every time you pass the test, you get stronger. When we look at Jesus, he kept it simple. He did not argue. He didn't uh, try to engage in discussion. He kept it simple and turned focus. Notice that he set and established and reestablished priority. And the priority was always his father. Don't tempt your father. Man does not live by bread alone. Worship your worship our father, worship Yahweh. This, these are all things that are really just refocusing away from the testing, and he passed the test. There's, there's a lot of parallels here between the children of Israel who came out of Egypt and wandered in this, you know, a similar wilderness for 40 years and did not pass the test, really. Jesus, 40 days, and passed the test. There are um, a lot of messages to get from this, and temptation is going to hit us uh, hard. But the one thing that we do really need to understand is that, is that we, need, we need to be ruled by God. We need to trust in this, in this kingdom that is separate from all the other kingdoms of the world. And we're not going to change the world through present earthly kingdoms. We worship God. We should understand that religion is has its place, but it is a human construct to try and understand who God is. And when we put our eggs in that basket and don't put them in the relationship with God basket, then pretty soon our religion takes takes the four, but it's also thin, and there's nothing to it without a relationship. We should trust in God and let the structure of religion teach us about that relationship, help us with that relationship. But when that structure gets in the way, then, then it's not a good structure and it needs to be redefined. Economically, there are times that we need to feel the burden that we are responsible for those who are around us. Yes, people are hungry, and yes, we need to take care of that. But at the same time, we need to do what Jesus did and reestablish the fact that there's a deeper, greater hunger that has to be satisfied or you're always going to be hungry, both physically and spiritually. That hunger can only be satisfied through, again, God. Everything focuses us. All of these temptations, all of these tests focus us back to the person of God. There are... There are answers that Jesus uses for his temptations, but these are the ways for us to also find freedom. Freedom from being tied to politics, tied, and and there's nothing wrong with politics unless you're tied, unless you're a slave to it. Slaves to religion. There's nothing wrong with religion. It has its place unless you're a slave to it. Economics. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having physical need. But unless, if you're slave to it, all of these things can become masters that are separate from the kingdom of God. The good news is we don't have to be slaves to any of those things. And when we put our perspective right, then all of those things fall into place exactly where they should be. Temptation is always going to be with us because we're constantly going to be tested by our friends, by our family, by Satan himself. And sometimes we're going to be led to that place by God to have so that we can prove to ourselves and to him that we are who we say we are.
Jesus calls and we respond. That happens over and over again in this partnership that we define as our relationship as the church and as the kingdom with Jesus, our King. It is usually his initiative, but he also asks us to take part. So he asks us to come to the table, to take part in getting to know everybody in the kingdom. This is for the benefit of the community, not necessarily each individual. But each individual is strengthened when they are within a community, where they are connected, where they are active, where they are praying for each other, where they are loving each other, where they are helping each other. And that, Jesus says, is how you love me. So he calls us to a table, a table where we enact what we call communion out of that word, community. This is a relationship both with Jesus and remembering what he did for us, but also with each other. And that's why we invite you to always be a part of this, even if we're not in the same building. The church is not defined by close proximity. The church is defined by being called for one purpose. And called together today sometimes means that we're called together over airwaves and over digital resources. And that's the way it works today. And so the church is greater. And we have seen that the church is greater than just our little congregation. And so we invite you, along with ourselves, to be a part of this global table where Jesus invites us to remember that he lived out his life to the point of death. He gave up, but not just gave up, he gave us his body. He gave us his life so that our words would be in him and his words in us, so that together we would be one like he and his father are one. And so in that strange mystery of symbolism, the bread and the cup, his body and his blood, we invite you to join with us as the disciples joined with Jesus. When he took the bread and he blessed it with a traditional blessing they had heard before, and he handed it around to all of them, but then he said, this is my body given to you. Take this, eat all of it, and we do. He did the same with the cup, and he said, all of you, this is my blood, my life, what has coursed through me and is coursing through me, I want to course through you. When you are in me and my words are in you, we can be one. I'm not just spilling my blood. I'm giving it, my life, to you. Take this, all of you, and drink it. And we do. Let's pray together. Father, we understand so little of what is going on here. We understand so little of the mystery of the Spirit and the mystery of the workings of your Father, the creation mystery, the dance of the planets, how things work. We continually learn, 
But we do know this, you are faithful, and what you say is true. And we, knew, we know that the kingdom is slowly, little by little, overtaking this broken world, and that we are on the front lines. And so we ask that we would remember what our job is, not to be the captain of the ship, not to be the king of the universe, not to be the judge, but to be those that love, so that you are reached, not by fear, but because no one can resist the love. We pray that we will exhibit that love. And we can only do it when we are empowered by the Spirit. That is not something that is humanly possible sometimes with some people we know. And so when we are asked to love people who do not love us, humanly, we might find that impossible. But divinely, with you living in us, all things are possible. And so we pray that we will be healed, that we will be unified as a church, that we will grow and cause the kingdom to grow by loving one another as you have loved us. We pray that you will bind us together, keep us together, help us to see that community of faith. Help us to realize that it is a God that we have that looks at the flock, that creates people to be together, that helps us to see that we are stronger when we are together. Help us to see that, help us to know that, help us to walk faithfully. And we ask that you would come Thank you for hearing our prayers and being with us today. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Here, he is here. He has blessed us with his presence in this place. We will not be the same. sings, the heavens glorify His holy name. Now to the King eternal, immortal and invisible. To the God be honor and glory forever. Amen. Here he, he is here. He, he has blessed us with his presence in this place. We will not be the same. Can you hear all creation sings? The heavens glorify His holy name. Now to the King eternal, immortal land in Oh